time a speech on collective bargaining and it was something that i had worked on a great deal and through that i came to develop a very close association with the ffa and that led to a an association with the national farmers organization i think we've seen a lot of changes in nfo i know we've seen a lot of changes in nfo in those last 10 years i think uh the results of that that contest uh, kind of uh, indicate that this was a speech on collective bargaining which was nfo one judge and there was there was 13 people in this contest one judge thought that speech was the best of the 13 one judge thought it was the second best of the 13 and the third judge thought it was the poorest one in there so consequently i didn't go any farther in that uh, that speech contest but i don't think that uh, that we have that kind of, of prejudice to deal with anymore and i think one of the big reasons for that is going to be is because of the people that we have in the the leadership positions of the organization the people that are going to be speaking to us here this evening i'd like to take just a minute here before we get into it to explain maybe where my association uh, with the organization came from and i can't think of a better way to do that than to look at the creed of the future farmers of america now if the national farmers organization was to ever develop a, a creed that would embody the beliefs of the organization and the members i think it would be very well put to just simply copy the ffa creed and it goes something like this i believe in the future of farming with a faith born not of words but of deeds achievements won by present and past generations of farmers in the promise of better days through better ways even as the better things we now enjoy have come to us from the struggles of former years I believe that to live and work <clears throat> on a good farm is pleasant as well as challenging, for I know the joys and discomforts of farm life and hold an inborn fondness for those associations which even in hours of discouragement I cannot deny. I believe in leadership from ourselves and respect from others. I believe in my own ability to work efficiently and think clearly with such knowledge and skill as I can secure. And in the ability of organized farmers to market the product of our toil. I believe that we can safeguard those practices. I believe that we can safeguard those rights against practices and policies that are unfair. I believe in less dependence on begging and more power in bargaining. In the life abundant with enough honest wealth to help make it so for others as well as myself. In plain square with others whose happiness depends upon me. I believe that rural America can and will hold true to the best traditions of our national life and that I can exert an influence in my home and community in that inspiring task. I think that summarizes the beliefs of the National Farmers Organization and that is what has drawn me to be associated with the organization. At this time, I would like to introduce our Vice President, Mr. Bob Arndt. Bob has been associated with the organization for more years than what I know, so I'll let, let him tell you about that. Jim, thank you. I want to welcome each and every one of you, young farmers, to the Young Farmers Meeting of this convention. 
We set up the Young Farmers Meeting because we are particularly interested in the young farmers as we move into the second generation of leadership of this organization. Any organization will die unless we develop leadership among our membership into the second and third generation. But I think this year is more important than perhaps the years of the past. We're concerned, and as I'm sure you are concerned, about the future of young farmers. With the costs skyrocketing, interest rates climbing, the income of agriculture predicted to be 20 to 30 percent less next year, it is almost an impossibility for young farmers to get into the business of farming and ever hope to pay off their debt. There is one hope, and that hope is that the members of this organization, those from the very beginning of the early days, along with the young farmers that we need as leaders at this time, and those that will become members that are trying to get into farming, with their effort in working together and putting production together to develop a power block in the marketplace. That hope in nationwide collective bargaining is the only hope for agriculture's future and the future of the young farmers across this country. For that purpose, we ask the young farmers to come to this meeting. We want to present to you the well-qualified, highly trained staff that we have in this organization to impress upon you that by blocking your commodities together with your fellow members, that you can have all the confidence in the world that those commodities will be used to be negotiation, used in negotiations with the industry to nail down contracts and cost of production plus a reasonable profit. That someday you will be able to pay off your debt and hand the ownership of your land to the generation behind you. I'm going to turn this back to Jim now. We've got several of the commodity department people here. They're all here. And they're all going to come forward, be introduced, take a few minutes to cap the departments that they're in charge of. And if you've attended the department meetings this afternoon, you'll recognize that what they have to say is just an addition and a cap to what you've heard today. So, Jim, I'm going to turn this back to you. And good luck. Thank you. I'm now going to do something that may turn out to be a, a great mistake. I work for the grain department, and I'm not going to introduce the grain department first. I hope that doesn't turn out to be a mistake. The cattle, uh, the meat department has requested to have the opportunity to speak to you first. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce a man that I cannot say that I know very well and, and personally, but it is a man that I have a great deal of respect for from his reputation and his accomplishments prior to NFO and with NFO. I'd like to introduce Walt Hagney. Thank you, Jim. It's difficult to capsule what our plans are for the National Farmers Organization for this fiscal 1980. I think it would be best to tell you briefly that the departments in the livestock and meat are ready for you to use. We have the feeder cattle division, the slaughter cattle division, the hog division, and the sheep division. Those programs are fine-tuned. The contracts are ready to be used by you. There isn't actually very much that we can do at this point in time to improve our posture in the marketplace other than ask you for your total commitment and involvement to us as a unit. The Livestock and Meat Department as a unit 
have spent countless hours and days and years in becoming presentable for you at this meeting. I think that in total, the Livestock and Meat Department has probably become as recognized and has probably gained as much rapport and confidence from the processor community in the shortest time, in fact, the last two years, as any time in my lifetime I've seen anyone respond. You've got to remember that the ability to collect and deliver and describe and merchandise has become almost a new entity for the National Farmers Organization as far as the livestock and meat department's concerned within the last two or three years. I can tell you tonight that this organization's commodity departments are in tune and are simply waiting for your participation. It requires training, it requires confidence in you, it requires your expression to the members in the country concerning our commodities. We gratefully appreciate your participation this past year. I want to lay out one simple fact. As these men I want to introduce to you will come forth here, I want to tell you that I have given a pledge to the National Board that the hog department will increase their production 112% in fiscal 1980. I want to tell you the feeder department will increase their production 50%, slaughter cattle 75 and sheep 100%. We don't mind the challenge. We feel it is certainly obtainable. We feel that through the participation we expect from the membership, it's there. We have it ready, the contracts, as I said, are ready, and all we need is your total participation. So with that, I would like to ask the Director of Operations, Merle Sunken, to come forth, please, and give you a short rundown of our plans for the Hog Division. Merle. <laughs> I hate to pick on Walt, but you know what I told you in a couple of meetings this morning, you know, he's limping a little bit worse tonight. <laughs> Starting to play on sympathies just a little bit more. <laughs> now they're bringing a chair right up here for him. You notice that? Super. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll just take just a moment of your time with what you just heard Walt Hackney say, the director of the Meat Commodity Department, the Hog Division. Goal is 112% of what we're presently running. Well, I will assure you, ladies and gentlemen, right now there's not a ghost of a chance for the Hog Division to do it without your help. And I made some promises this afternoon, and I'll make them here right now once again, that we will, in the Hog Division, we have many, many programs that, through the South Sala program, I'm sure that we were able to prove this day that have been a total success because of your participation in the programs that we have laid forth. We have other programs that we'll be coming out with, a continuation of the South Sell Off program, implementation of the commitment to ratify and getting you people as leaders in the organization and leaders across this great nation to participate in the actual negotiations of some of these contracts that we'll be talking about in the very near few days. So with that, I'm sure that we do have, we've got direct delivery on your hogs, we've got a graded program for your hogs, we have forward sales contracts for your hogs where you don't pay any margin charges, any margin calls, it's a direct sale to the packer, nobody's going to play with it and buy it and resell it and make profits on it. The National Farmers Organization, they never take ownership of your product, they are a bargaining organization on behalf of its membership. We do have the programs. We're confident in them. We want to get you directly involved in all areas as soon as we can, as quick as we can, and I think that'll probably start about Monday morning. I would like to report to you today that our director, Alan Stroh, did get home from the hospital. He's back at Corning, Iowa. He did get out of Omaha Hospital today, and he is on crutches. 
and we're trying to keep him a little bit down, but he really wanted to be here with you this evening. I hope that I've taken a small part of him with us through the convention, and I look forward in the hog division working with each and every one of you, and thank you. Thank you, Mo. The next gentleman I'd like to introduce is the director of our sheep and lamb division, Dick Hammond from Ogden, Utah. The sheep division has arrived, and it has. We've done, we've put the programs together, we've got prices, we used to hear an awful lot of problems talking about the fact that we didn't, we weren't competitive and that sort of thing. I sat in a meeting today where somebody got up and said, look, since the last five years, uh, we've either been on the market or above it. We've got people and staff that are qualified to bargain for you. We've got people and staff that are able to check out the financial arrangements. Uh, we've got people and staff that can do anything in the sheep program that's necessary to bring about a satisfactory price and a cost of production plus a reasonable profit, except we have one missing link. The sheep division can't sign a contract for sale. I'm going to talk to Devon about that and see if we can't go out in the country and sign those things for you. But uh, I understand the, the ground rules are that you have to participate, and that part of that participation is signing that contract for sale. And we need it. And when you go into a bargaining situation and you put a stack of contracts up there like that and say, now these aren't on the market, and you're not going to run down the road here and talk to so-and-so and get these lambs bought away from this block, you're going to have to deal with me. So we might as well just settle down and get down to bargaining. NFO has given me the privilege of representing the largest lamb block in the United States. NFO has also given me the privilege of having the only national sheep program in the United States. These things you have done, these things you have given to me, and also the obligations that go along with it. I think you've got one thing to make up your mind to. And it's very simple. You've got two decisions. Do you want to use the NFO system, the program, the one designed for you, administrated for you, your own organization, your own system, or do you use the other system, the system that is devised by gentlemen who have no other purpose but to glean the greatest profit from you? Thank you. Thank you, Dick. The next fellow that I'd like to introduce is the assistant director of the feeder cattle division, Gary Ellis. I'll tell you what we got. We got the greatest feeder cattle operation in the world. We really do. Uh, we've got the best bunch of guys that I've ever worked with in a feeder cattle division. And we've got something in the NFO feeder cattle division in Corning, Iowa, that I think any other feeder cattle operation of any type in the United States would actually give their soul to have the contacts, the collection delivery system that we've got in NFO. And we've got about three ways that I want to tell you about right quick here that we move feeder cattle. We have regular ratification meetings at which we price two nights before our sale. The cattle then are moved the second day after the pricing meeting. We sell load lots of cattle or better direct and we have future contracts. And I think everybody that was on NFO's future contracts for feeder cattle this year are more than satisfied and I want to thank all of you for helping us and I want to see you all back on them next year and your friends along with you. Thank you much. The next person will be Steve Bohr, 
the director of the Slaughter Cattle Division. I want to ask you a question. If you had a set of cattle to sell and two people called on you, one of them was a buyer that was going to buy those cattle from you just as cheap as possible. And the other one was going to assist you in selling those cattle for as high as possible. I wonder if you have a hard time making up your mind which one of those people you would want having doing business with you. It seems like there's a lot of people in the United States that are having a problem with that. You don't have any options available to you in any kind of a market in the country that you don't have available within this organization. And another thing that Bob Art brought out to you that I think is very important, he said the year 1980 he thought was going to be one of the most important years yet because of interest rates and operating costs skyrocketing you know, there's an odd situation facing us right now and that we're at the bottom of the cattle cycle and we're having a problem making profits on fed cattle. The next time you're talking to your banker, maybe you ought to mention that to him and ask him what he thinks will happen within three or four years when we reach the top of the cattle cycle. I agree with Bob. I believe 1980 is a pretty important year because we're starting to rebuild. And within the next few years, when the cattle become more abundant, your profits may diminish at that time. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that he's right and that 1980 is going to be a year when the farmers and ranchers in this country end up balancing the economic cycle that fell apart in the 1970s. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what you have available to you in line of the various commodities in the livestock and meat divisions. I would hope that you recognize each of these men for what they are. They could walk out of your organization tomorrow morning, and as I've said before, each and every one of them could go to work in a comparable field, and they could become one of the class individuals as far as buying from you as that competitive buyer that Steve was just referring to. They've got that same ability and that same expertise to express for you. It simply boils down to one thing. You've got to participate. You've got to have the confidence in these people that are expressed in them by the same people that are allowing them to spend money for them to procure your product. You got to understand that the packing interests are allowing these bargainers to physically take their dollars and apply them to your product for them, sight unseen in most cases. That couldn't have happened a couple years ago. It has only happened within the last year or so and that's why I have no qualms about committing ourselves to this increased goal of production for 1980. My only problem is sitting in your seat. If you respond as the packing and processing interests have responded to this kind of talent that has been put together for you, then I can assure you that next year we'll be talking about a goal we set that was so obtainable that we in fact raised it. Thank you very much, Jim. Good luck on your program. I thank you, Bob. We'll see you tomorrow. For those of you that 
or that was your first exposure to Walt Hackney, I think you can see why it is very easy to respect him. And I think that with what he announced there as goals, that you have got to realize that the four people that he introduced have got to be some intelligent, dedicated, hardworking people that'll, that will accomplish those goals. Now I'd like to introduce the dairy department. I had the opportunity not too long ago to spend a little bit of time working in Ed's home state of Wisconsin. And I'll tell you people, you don't have to spend very much time working among the dairy people to find out just how serious they are about making collective bargaining work. And Mr. Graff is one of the chief reasons for that. Thank you, Jim. Every time I come to a young farmers meeting, I have one big regret. That's that I'm not young anymore. <laughs> I don't know what I could say in five minutes of the time that I have here tonight to explain our program, but I think we reached a pinnacle today. Maybe people didn't recognize it. A man spoke to the convention, to the dairy meeting today, from a, the dairy industry that's not known nationwide but worldwide. That was from Beatrice Food. And his opening remarks were that they are doing business with the National Farmers Organization and hope to expand that business, and then went on to explain the strength of Beatrice Food, the size of Beatrice Food. And if there's anything that I think I perhaps had problems with in the first 10 years in the dairy department was to convince farmers that if they were willing to keep this production block together, we would someday reach the point that we could negotiate with and market and bargain with the biggest processor in the world. And today he faced the people in this convention and talked to them. And I can tell you I remember one day when I thought we had made headway when a little cheesemaker from Illinois had signed the first contract with the National Farmers Organization, and that probably was 15 years ago. But we had made a stride to prove ourselves that we could be a supplier. We could deliver the product, and he sat at the table at that meeting, and he said, we can't pay you more than what we pay your competitor are the competitors that we buy from, and I said, that's fine, but we never expect that you're ever going to pay us less either. And he knew why we were here, to get cost of production. And I think that's a major accomplishment for the farmers who have put that production together. One thing that I want to comment on, to those of you who know and have met Ted McCarty, who came from the industry and has been with us, just a year ago, last April, made a comment today that I didn't know he was going to make. He said, when I came with this organization, I thought, what a cumbersome system they've set up. He indicated that perhaps somebody was almost off their rocker when they set up the structure in the NFO and the trust system. Today, he said, I understand that that's going to be the salvation for dairy farmers. So I believe that what has been set up and we're using is what every farmer in America wants. We have not been able to explain it thoroughly and totally and get them to come with this and use this system of marketing. I, I think that example that Steve Bohr used here just a minute ago was tremendous. You know that every buyer out there is trying to buy as cheap from you as you, they possibly can. 
and another man can say, we'll help you all we can. If we get that story across, I think there's no doubt that this organization is well on its way. I told them, and especially to the young people, that your communication with other young people is going to make this organization go. I frankly said, in all sincerity, I wished all the people I saw at that dairy meeting today were new faces. Not that I don't like the old timers, but I'd like to see the new ones come in, the new people participating in this program. Because then I would know that we had finally broken a bad habit. That's a bad habit of using the old marketing system in all commodities that has the American farmer deeper in debt than any time in history. And why anyone would continue to want to use a system like that when there's one available working to get him cost of production can only be for one reason. He doesn't understand. And that's our job, to get him to understand. And I think it is a habit. And I can say tonight, as freely and easily as I've ever spoken to any group, all we need is production. All we need is the volume that you people can put together. And we'll receive the prices that we, that we demand and need. And the habit that we've got to break is one that I have to finish up with a little story. Why do we market as we have in the past? It's the same as why did the lady who put the ham in the roaster cut the end of it off before she put it in the roaster. And the husband said, why did you do that? And she said, I don't know, but my mother did it. So he said, why did your mother do it? Let's ask her. She said, I don't know, my mother always did it. The grandmother was living. So they said, let's ask her. She said, very simple, my roaster was too small. <laughs> we break the habit, put our production through this organization. We can handle it, we'll get our prices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Makes a good point with a short story. Did uh, Shelley slip in? Shelley Robertson? Okay. <clears throat> I had a specific reason besides what I said earlier about uh, introducing the meat department first, and that was to save the best till last. <laughs> no doubt about it. With that, <laughs> with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ralph Kettleson, head of the grain department. He made good points, didn't he? <laughs> I'm particularly pleased to address the young farmers because I have to work with these other old fellows, and it's nice to get with somebody my age. <laughs> We've had a good day today. We've been putting a lot of grain together. I am firmly convinced that our membership is really starting to understand what we're talking about, and that is production. We've been talking systems for a year, and we absolutely know for sure by now that that old system, that brand X, can't work. Going to take a new system, and we've got it. Absolute exclusive. No one else in the country. Regional offices, communications all over the country, and we're going to very shortly have a new computer. Key in everything. Going to be a beautiful system. Better than it is now. And I don't have any doubt where we're going. I heard Walt's goals. He said he was going to increase 112. 
We're going up at least a thousand. And it's because of our attitude, I think, as a group of farmers. We know we have to do it, don't we? I like to just point out with a, everybody else has taken so much time, I just want to tell you a little story. It's about attitude. It concerns a football type player who married, uh, he was a six foot six and 240 pounds, and he marries his petite little gal, and they go on the honeymoon, and they register at a hotel, and they get into the room, and the first thing that he does is remove his trousers, and he's handed it over to her and said, here, you put these on. And being very dutiful, new wife and all, she stepped into them very dutifully, and of course the trousers was out about to here, and she was standing where his knees had been, and she says, I can never fill these out. He says, that's right. He says, I'm the one who wears the pants in this outfit. <laughs> and so she stepped out of them. And then she also stepped out of her own little panties. And she says, here, you put these on. And he looked at those little bitty things and he says, well, he said, I can never get into those. She says, that's right. And with your attitude, you never will either. <laughs> What can you say? <laughs> I didn't hear that, but it must have been good. <laughs> okay, when I said that we were saving the best to last, I was obviously speaking of the department heads because there's a gentleman that we haven't heard from yet. And I think that uh, it's no mystery of who that is going to be. And we're running just on schedule. We'll be able to get over to the auditorium for the session this evening at 8.30. But I really wasn't worried about it a great deal as long as Devon was still in this room. I knew we weren't going to be late. <laughs> Devon? This is a super bunch of fellows that you have representing you in the commodity departments. It's taken 25 years to put the staff together that has the capabilities, the desire, the knowledge, the know-how to serve you. Here about a month ago, I called a staff meeting in my office and asked them all to come in. I had a blackboard sitting there, and I said, now I want each of you to step to that blackboard and tell me what you're going to do in the next 12 months. That's where you got the figures from that you heard tonight. And as we put those figures together, that's where we got the figures from that you heard last night. I'm convinced it's gonna happen. Why? Because they were the ones that said, I will do it. Now, if I'd came up with some figures as fellows, now, here's what I want you to do next month, and this is what I want you to have done a year from now, they wouldn't have been nearly as eager nor would have they applied themselves. But when they came and told me, this is what we're going to do, I have full confidence it will happen. I've got about 10 good, strong men that surround me and help me. And when they take an assignment, I sleep good. I don't lay awake work worrying about it because I know they will do what they said they would do. Now, I'm glad to see that we have people here who are not only young, but those who are young at heart. And I know that the wives with those young people that are here, they understand what we're talking about sometimes better than the husband. You know why they do? If they run just a little short of cash, they eat soup three times a day, or they'll cook a pot of beans, and the grocery sack will suffer. If they want a couch, a rug, and the husband needs an auger, repairs, 
What do you suppose they do? They would do without the couch and the rug. And so you women, you can become a motivating force, you wives. You're 50% of that operation. You're part of the assets. You're part of the liability. And I remember about a month ago, I was traveling with a group, and Andrew Young happened to be in the group, and as he would speak to that group of people there in those countries in Africa, he would say, you ought to come to America and buy your food here. It's a supermarket for the world. You can buy anything you want, the best quality, variety, at the cheapest price anywhere in the world. And I heard him make that statement a time or two, and finally I said, Andy, I want you to sit down and explain to me why you say that. And I pursued to explain to him why I disagreed, and I told him, I said, Andy, I disagree with you. There's something wrong in what you're saying. Anytime a country or a company has the ability, because of its power, to extract unjustly from those who provide services to that country or company, it's wrong, morally wrong. And the American farmer is supplying food to not only our country, but countries of the world, because he has not got the ability to protect himself. It's being extracted from him unfairly, and he's creating a debt that will divide and split families, and it's wrong. And he never said it again. He said, I understand what you're saying. Well, the young people are going to be the future leaders of this organization, and we want you to know it. It's come a long ways in 25 years. It's got some more distance to cover. But the time will come when the hair will thin and turn gray, and we'll walk a little slower. But this organization can't walk. It's got to move faster. And you're going to have to move it. You need to get into the leadership of the counties, the districts, the state, and the national, and become informed and exposed to the workings of the organization. And if the young people don't involve themselves to that extent so they understand what the battle was all about and how important the battle was, have the background to carry on the purposes of the organization, the time will come when it will wither and die and become a part of history. This was driven home to us not too long ago. I wasn't there, but I had the report. The National FFA Convention was held in Kansas City here. We've been involved in that with a booth where we would go and explain our programs. And up until this year, as the sessions would break and the young people would pour out of the auditorium along where the booths were established, up until this year, they would walk to the corner of the NFO booth, turn and walk clear out around it, come back in on this side, and proceed on down the alley. This year, when they came out, they walked right down the front with their advisors. Why? Because what we told them 20 years ago, they now believe. And they know it's a must. It will be the future of agriculture. And where there was an older fellow standing behind a booth, and we had three young fellows like Jim. Were you there, Jim? We had three young fellows behind our booth. And those booths that had the old gray-headed fellow and the bald-headed fellow standing there, they never stopped to talk to him because they didn't have anything in common with him. And they felt uncomfortable. They couldn't talk together about common issues. And the young people that's in the organization now have got to search out and find the young people that are not in here. We can't do it. Well, it's good to be here with you tonight. 
It's been a good convention. It isn't over. We have a different atmosphere in our conventions than we've ever had before. There isn't any more floor stomping or pulpit pounding going on as we used to have over the years. But we have those assembled in the meetings who are anxious to learn and want to absorb everything that they possibly can. And there's a very solemn atmosphere in the convention because we are now a business organization. It's good. Thank you, and stay with us another day or two, and we'll tell you what you have to do tomorrow night to make this thing work.